this is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with author and photographer Dan Ephraim about his latest project, the Steve Keen Art Book. The work documents the lifestyle, motivation, and paintings of Steve Keen one of the world's most prolific artists who has sold or given away more than 300,000 paintings in his career. Guest essays by the likes of Shepard Ferry and Ryan McGinnis are interspersed with photos by Ephraim that document Keene's process. And now, painting a portrait of the prolific Steve Keene with author Dan Ephraim. much for joining us this week on the Art Sense podcast to talk about your new book project, the Steve Keen Art Book. And maybe a good place to start is how would you describe Steve Keen's artwork? Well, it's hard to describe Steve's artwork uh, without explaining or giving some context that he is perhaps the most prolific American artist of all time. Um, And so his artwork is a reflection in some ways about his production style as much as um, the work itself. He is a trained artist, but if you look at his work, you might see it as um, in more of an outsider feel to it it, for for various reasons. But he creates pieces in mass. And so he... He creates these, uh, these pieces that are eclectic, they're sometimes portraits, they're usually uh, sometimes uh, emulation of photos and pictures that he's either referencing directly um, or, of course, are in his mind. But he paints within a cage, a chain link fence, eight foot high, six wall, if you will, because there's an intersection as well, cage that acts as his easel where he's able to place between 40 and 60 pieces of wood, three-eighths-inch plywood, which acts as his his, his canvas, if you will, um, around the edges of this fence, this cage. And so he paints 40, 60 pieces at a time. And of those 40, 60 pieces, there's usually 15 different series. (laughs) So... It's hard to, so it's hard to, what does he do? Does he do portraits? Yes. Uh, for example, in the book, there's uh, a bunch of pieces by, uh, about presidents. He does a series of presidents, okay? Um, so those are portraits, but, you know, they're, 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 they're illustrations. They're, um, they're usually, uh, again, they're on, they're on three and plywood. They're usually acrylic. Um, and it's, it's somewhat, you know, it's, it, is it, is it realistic? Mm-hmm. Not really. It's it's not cartoonish uh, either, um, but it, it it has a flavor to it. I don't know if this really answers your question, but I'm trying to get there. Uh, he it, there's a number of different styles that he has. Uh, he, you know, he, uh, that, uh, that we can talk about. How did this project come together? How did you first meet Steve Keen? I first met Steve Keen. Um, his work through my love of. Uh, indie rock music in the 90s. Um, I basically ran into him and his work at almost every rock and roll show, rock show that I went to. He was selling affordable art at merch tables in New York City. I guess, you know, that that's a great segue into the relationship between Steve Keen's artwork and music, right? Yeah. A lot of his work is inspired by music. A lot of his work's inspired by album covers. And it seems like it's even gotten a little meta in that bands started reaching out to him for artwork for their albums, right? Yeah, he, he start, he's, he's from Charlottesville. And um, so he started there and he really developed this idea of... Um, I mean, just starting from the beginning, I guess, really is where we should with him and give some background. He started in Charlottesville. He went to school again for art. All this, he did all this work, and then he realized, like, you know, it's really difficult to to make to make living as an artist. How are you going to do that? What's the best way to do that? And he was just, you know, 
you know, from my long conversations with him, um, he was interested in, in just painting as, you know, why wouldn't you be if you're an artist? And he tried to figure out a way where he could create a niche for himself where he could paint as much as his heart desired and be able to somehow make a living at it. And he was a dishwasher for a while, um, and he was making, in essence, minimum wage or not much more than that. And he wasn't happy doing that, but he was happy painting. And his, his, you know, his ethos is a very simple one in, in some ways, and very and complicated in terms of how he actually delivers the work and thinks of the work. But his idea was, how do I, in essence, make enough to live uh, and still be able to paint? Simple, right? How do we do this? And his way was to, in essence, create mass pieces, you know, uh, paintings in mass, uh, affordably priced, so that you really, they're so cheap that you literally can't say no when you see them. Um, and you have to buy them. And again, and, and so that, in essence, in volume, um, he would, in essence, create his niche. And 30 years later, he painted over 300,000 pieces by hand. Hard to believe, but if you add it up, it actually works out. He does it does about 50 pieces a session, 200 a week, 30 years. You know, it, you can do the math if you want. It's more than 300. And so, um, it's it's a very, you know, it's a very interesting idea. This concept of how to be, how to you know how to be an artist in this world. And of course, his world started in the 90s. He didn't want to stay within the, the gallery count confines. He's fine with galleries it seems, but it wasn't really his thing. So, in a way, he doesn't really fit into that world. Um, occasionally he'll get a show at a gallery and that works out, but they have to treat it in, a, in usually a different way in order to sell affordable art like this, uh, uh, like he does. So how did the book as a project come together? Uh, the book came together as a I was curating a couple of shows for him just as a friend. I've been working with him, you know, on and off, just known him, hired him, commissioned him to do uh, paintings for some of my uh, musical artists that I represented as a manager. Um, I represented a band called The Apple Stereo and, um, and some other bands as well, and, and The Cosmetics, other bands that had commissioned him for artwork for the record covers. And... Um, so I've known him for a few years, and at one point or another, I just saw that he hadn't had a, a, a New York show in a while, and I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe I could pitch one for him. I did, and we did a show at the Brooklyn uh, Public uh, Library, uh, which was a really fantastic show in, in I think it was 2014. And then uh, I asked Steve some, for some of his favorite uh, artists, contemporary artists, and one of them he mentioned was Shepard Ferry. Um, as it would turn out, I, in 2015, I was in Los Angeles, and I had meant to get in touch with Shepard about doing a show. And this is a funny story, I think, or a good story. I think it reflects well on Shepard, actually. Um, I had done some work with Shepard previously, but didn't know him to, uh, enough to have a direct email or anything like that. Um, at the end of my business trip, I literally... You know, Eureka, I forgot to get in touch with Shepard Ferry about Steve. What am I doing? Um, so I, I didn't have an email. I went to the – Shepard has a gallery in Los Angeles called Subliminal Project. Mm -hmm. um, and I just went to the website and emailed info at Subliminal Project. I mean, I just – and put Steve Keen in the subject. And, you know, are you fans of Steve Keen was what I wrote. That was it. And – I didn't expect anything. I thought I had actually missed my opportunity because I was literally traveling home the next day. On, you know, my flight was booked. Sure. And I thought, well, I at least, you know, I should at least try and reach out. And lo and behold, um, Shepard himself responded to that email within, I think it was within 30 minutes. You know, wow. That's, that's what I remember. It might have been a little longer, might have been a little bit less even, but that's approximately right. And I was just blown away by that. He said, yeah, I'm a big fan. What, you know, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it ended up that he said, come by the office tomorrow and we'll, we'll talk about this. I basically said, I think he said, what can I do to help? That's what I think he said. And 
said, well, would you want to do a show? <laughs> Literally in the email, uh, the first email back to him. <laughs> right. And, uh, and he said, come in and talk tomorrow and let's, let's talk about it. And I changed my flight. I remember and went into the office and we met for a couple hours and immediately he gave me, you know, an opportunity to, of, of dates to talk to Steve about. And I was just blown away. So, I mean, literally this book happened because really because Shepard jumped in and said, you know what, I'm going to put my, my flag in the, in, in the ground and say, I'm a Steve Keen fan. This guy deserves to, you know, be seen, be recognized. And when, you know, we, we went through the process of doing the show, um, I was taking photos of Steve's work. Steve doesn't archive his work. So there's no real archive of what's going on. Wow. I was taking photos for the gallows because they want one for their catalog. Of course. Right. Even if they're going to sell it less expensively, they have a catalog. You know, I don't think they realized, maybe he did. I mean, no Steve, so he knew that he worked in that. But I had to, you know, there was, we delivered 800 pieces to the gallery. You know, um, 800 pieces wow. delivered to the gallery. <laughs> Talk about gallery show. Every inch of subliminal project from floor to ceiling was covered. And he's seen. So I had, I was the curator and arranged all this, supposedly, if that's what you call it. And uh, <laughs> and um, so I was responsible for providing all the information. One of the things was taking photos. So I had to take photos of them all. And I thought, you know, when I got, when we finally did the show, I was so busy, I didn't really think about it. But as the show launched, um, I finally thought, like, wow, you know, there's a line out the door. People can't get in. We sold 600 or 550 pieces the first night. Wow. I mean, you know, like, it was just insane. And and I just thought, wow, you know, this would probably make an interesting book someday once I, you know, get over this. <laughs> once I get right. over this and get sleep for two weeks, like, this might make a good book. Um, and that's where the project, uh, you know, really started. It was like, wow, Shepard got behind this. There's a line out the door. He sold a lot of pieces anyway, and he has a fan base. Shouldn't he have a book? Right. And I was, I've just been inspired by Steve for so many years. I just thought, wow, I, who else is going to do this? I'm, I'm, this is it. This was, this was the moment. And I captured at least some of it. And so in the book, you know, you have essays written by guests, including Shepard, including Ryan McGinnis, who's another weighty name, you know, and, and Ryan's contribution was really interesting because it's, it's kind of an interview format. He's trying to help us peel back the, the onion in terms of what's going on in, in Steve's mind. And I think that interview kind of demonstrates that Steve is more than just a naive outsider, that he has put a lot of thought into what his practice and career is, right? Well, Brian has a long history with Steve as well, as, as you might have read. And um, and I think that piece that he did is just spectacular. I mean, Ryan, I've known for probably, actually, yeah, almost exactly as long as Steve. We worked on a project um together um i actually uh was at least partially responsible for introducing ryan to steve and um anyway as you if you know ryan you know he's a process hound like he just just feeds off of like how did you do this it's so inquisitive right and i one of the one of the things i love about ryan um and his work and and just how he presents Everything and I've and I've been very lucky to work with him on a number of of, of things, um, a number of projects. So having him write this um, was really amazing. Uh, I didn't think he was going to be able to do it at first, um, but as <laughs> sort of uh, fortunately, unfortunately, one of the happy uh, occurrences of the the book taking six and a half years to uh, produce um, <laughs> that it, there was finally a window where <laughs> where Ryan could actually uh, uh, write something uh, and, and it fit into the book on time. So right. that was one of the, the, the happy, happy uh, accidents of it taking so long to make. But uh, I just love the idea of, I mean, as an artist myself, uh, appreciator of art, loving process myself, 
um, but not having the the the, the real uh, knowledge that Ryan brings to it, um, it, it just seemed like wow, he's coming at this from what he's interested in, and I thought that added just such a again a very intriguing element to the book. Like, um, what is it that this process hound is interested in? Because he is is all process. Not all. I mean, it's not all process, but there's such such a process involved with this. Can that Ryan was able to dig beneath the veneer of um, what how Steve works was just fascinating. And it's a long piece that he does. Mm-hmm. And at first I thought, wow, you know, should we include all this? But after I read it for the second time, I think I was like, wow, you know, this we this book. It's called the Steve Key book because I don't know if there'll ever be another. I hope there is. There should be, in my opinion. This guy should be celebrated by uh, Americana uh, as a whole, um, you know, for many reasons, for the joy he's, he's brought to the people that have received one of the 300,000 pieces he's made. I mean, that's a huge impression that an artist can make. Sure. Um, he should be celebrated. But the book was also made to be like, okay, you want to make a Steve Keen art book? you got to have something to challenge this because this is going to be it. This is like, you know, I wanted to put everything I could into it, make it as great as possible and as all-encompassing as possible. So having this real detailed description of of Steve's process with someone um, who I respect and and admire um, as much as I do Ryan is is just an amazing, amazing thing. I, I just think it brings so much to the book. It sounds like Shepard, part of what he appreciates in Steve's work is the process. And, you know, Shepard's kind of rooted in this screen printing um, and stenciling history. And he sees a lot of the same thought process going on in Steve's work, even though Steve's doing all of these things by hand. I mean, he's, you know, Steve's kind of like a a, a one-man Warhol factory. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, well, the, it's interesting you say that because he studied screen printing, so, so his process, I, I, he might even admit it in the book. I, I have to <laughs> get it myself what his quotes are, but I've heard him talk about this that you know, in essence, he's been influenced very much by screen printing. And if you look at the or think of the idea of creating fifty pieces uh, at once in sets of four. Um, you know, there's the primer coat, and then you build it. You go into more details from there. Um, it's kind of like screen printing. These are layers of a print. You know, this is how it works. And so he's thinking of this in the same way. And um, there's uh, I, that's certainly one of the reasons why Shepard. Uh, I mean, I've heard Shepard talk about this too, where you know there's an appreciation because obviously Shepard uh, work as it varies, there is uh, a lot of, of screen printing involved in it. So yeah, there's there's a lot of that. I, I think that that's where this, you know, Steve just created this, this world and there's a lot, it's part screen printing, at least in concept, right? And then there's also kind of a street mentality of it with the quickness that he works with. Um, so there's that right. and there's the fine art aspect where he's, you know, where if you look at his actual strokes, I think that you'll see some of that as well. So it's it's a and then there's the process, which is actually deeper than what you may think of in terms of you know he's actually cutting all the wood himself. He's actually there's hangers for each piece, right? And he's making a hanger for each piece mm-hmm. with a piece of wire. So he's he's creating everything himself. And as you put it, he's this Warholian um, sort of uh, idea, this uh, Warholian machine idea. This is part of it too. I mean, um, I think there's a, a real influence of pop art on this, and, as he does, for example, you know, obviously one of the one of the most important pe- uh, you know series that Warhol's known for is Campbell's Soup Can, right? So Steve has uh, a beer can right. series that he, not series, but a, a beer cans that he's done over the years, and to me they're referential. Like there's a mm-hmm. pop. There's a pop art component here that can't be denied. So there's a, to me, there's a lot of different, you know, influences here. And, and, but in the end, do these pieces speak to you? Yes or no? I mean, that's up to you. Um, to me, they just speak of joy. To me, they, they give me a lot of, a lot of pleasure. They're so colorful. They're so vibrant that, especially in these days, 
we could all use a little more joy. And I think that it's really interesting that this book took so long, but it's as coming out right now where the world is in such chaos, it seems. But this book, I think, is, you know, really, really, really fun and really vibrant and I think shows the career of, of, of an artist that has given so much joy uh, to fans with this vibrant artwork. I, I don't want it to be too weighty of a comparison, but you know, some of the things about Steve's practice does remind me of, of Van Gogh in terms of the bright, saturated colors. You know, there's a real focus on working as quickly as possible. He's very conscious about economy of strokes, right? Like how to say things in the least amount of information. Let me let me ask you this. Uh, there was a quote in your book from Ryan that says, Steve's one of the most important artists of the 21st century. What would motivate Ryan to say that? What does that stand on? Well, in my opinion, I, I, I always come back to the idea of how art affects life. And, you know, if you create art in a vacuum and no one sees it, you know, does it exist? You know, it's a you know, fairly obvious question, I guess, in some ways. Um, obviously, there are also a lot of artists that we can point to that just made their work for themselves and then may or may not have been discovered after the fact. You know, obviously, some of the more important ones, Darger, um, you know, was discovered afterwards mm -hmm. um, as a photographer, Vivian Mayer. Um, you know, these people made amazing work. Um, no one saw it until after they were gone, unfortunately. Um, but that wasn't what they wanted. That was probably their choice. Maybe it wasn't, but that was, you know, that's how they operated. Steve's idea is that people should have art and be able to afford it. That's his goal, you know. And he was the reason why I uh, got into, you know, collecting small pieces of handmade art myself. Uh, he, his were the first. At first, when I went to, you know, at the time when I was, you know, discovered Steve or, or, or found his artwork at merch tables at rock shows, well, I was buying records, I was buying posters of bands or, or things, things like that. I didn't realize I could afford like a hand-painted piece of art. That may just seem, you know, absurd. And was I interested in that? You know, I don't know. But because it was presented in this way, rock and roll way, do-it-yourself type of ethic that is somewhat punk rock as well, for sure, um, because it bucks the, the whole art industry, really throws it on its, on its head. Like, how could you not be into that? As, in, in, you know, from my perspective, how could I not be into that? So when Ryan says he's one of the most important artists of the 21st century, I think that he is referencing the idea of, you know, being cavalier, um, not fitting in to the system, as it were, and being and building and building his own world mm -hmm. that is self-sufficient now. I mean, now if you try and you know purchase artwork from Steve uh, online, it's you know over a six month wait for his work. Um, he's not charging any more than he has, and certainly he could, but he's not doing that, and that's because the fabric of Steve's work is ongoing. And his his work is the complete the, the really the the full three hundred fifty thousand pieces that he's made and how much joy that that has spread throughout the world. I think that's why people are important. Does your does your work resonate with anyone? Well, some people aren't going to like it and some people are going to love it. So, are the you know if you're spreading that much out there, that's a, that's having a huge impact. I mean, there's no other way around it. If you look at the amount of, I mean, it, it just, to me, it's about, there, there's a, 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 a volume-based equation to that discussion. If you don't, if you don't appreciate what he does, uh, or, or how, how he does it, rather, you have to appreciate the volume. And if you appreciate the volume, then you know that people are really into this, and a lot of people at that. And I think that's his power. You know, I was just having a conversation with a guest uh, recently about just how insulated the art world has become in terms of we've gone through a couple of decades where it was all about where did you go to school, who did you learn with, you know, whatever MFA program kind of molded you into this or that, and how 
unique thought expression reflection of your culture you know the 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 artist that's kind of doing his own thing you may not be getting the gallery representation in in his time but you know that stuff's gonna pop off the walls at some point because it's not gonna look like everything else that's kind of been turned out by this academic factory system right yeah i mean I- I mean, I think it's really interesting that it's hard to find your niche and it, it happens in different ways. You know, that's the thing. And Steve's was really, you know, brass tacks. How can I do this so that I don't have to wash dishes? I mean, that's, that's the foundation of his artwork is how do I do this so I don't have to wash dishes? So, okay, well, I basically need to sell a lot of pieces. Okay, well, how do I sell a lot of pieces if no one knows who I am? even if they're inexpensive, you know? So it's, you know, you, that's one, he picked this, this avenue, Blaine, and he has stuck with it for 30 years. Wow. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's to me, it's just, a, this is inspiring to me. That's why I'm here for you. Because mm-hmm. he even inspires me and he inspires like the good things. In me. <laughs> he sure. inspires the joy, he inspires this, his colors are vibrant and it gives me life talking about it. So that's why I'm here. So there's, so in terms of like, you know, telling, speaking to whether or not it'll be valuable. In the, I don't know. I think the value again, like the value is, is in your eyeballs. Do you like what you're seeing? It doesn't matter what it costs. You know, right. like obviously it does to some people and I'm not suggesting there isn't a value to an art market, but that's not what Steve operates within. And that's not really what this is about. This is about like a person that's done the same thing that's brought a lot of, of this vibrancy to life. So he's he's branched out a little bit, right? You have a, a section in the book where you look at his uh, tattooed plywood pieces, and then there's like the pavement trees. Can you talk about those plywood pieces? They they use like a CNC router, and then there's color added on. Can you help describe those? Yeah, sure. Um, like I, I mentioned before, all of his work that I've seen thus far has been pretty much on wood. So he's using wood as a, as a platform, if you will. Um, some of it is on cloth. When he does big murals, he'll, he'll do cloth. He doesn't do a lot of those, but there, there are some of those out there. Um, so this, these, these tattooed plywood pieces are um, basically, he will create uh, the artwork itself in a computer program of some sort it might be Photoshop, it might be another, and then it goes through a router uh, that, in, in essence, uh, you know, engraves uh, in these, you know, he's using four by eight pieces of wood um, or you know some variation, maybe three by six, but he'll cut different sizes of, of wood and he'll plant this, this, you know, he'll get these routed etchings into the uh, into the uh, uh, wood, and then he'll uh, basically paint over them in various ways, sometimes using uh, black sand uh, to uh, uh, show the lines that have been uh, engraved, hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, just painting on top as well. And those have become multi-layered and multi-dimensional as well. Some of uh, the newer pieces are not represented in the, in the book. Uh, it's one of the few things that Steve is not selling um, aggressively, um, he is holding them back. I'm not sure why he's holding them back, but he is holding back these more um, uh, these more layered versions of tattooed plywood that you see in the book. Um, these pieces, again, uh, also are accented by usually some verbiage of some sort that may or be, may not be nonsensical. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a what I like about Steve is that there's a real playfulness uh, to them, but there's also an introspection. And uh, I think he has a real uh, gift for showing both. And the taxi plywood pieces are, you know, there's a, a similarity using the medium wood, of course, um, but there's, um, and there, and of course the humor and some of that, but again, it's, it's these are computer, computer generated. So, you know, it's also a takeoff of what he does with his hands. In essence, when he's painting, he's reproducing all these pieces, you know, ad nauseum um, that he goes through each day and paints. 
um, and their reproduction. And there's usually four of a kind and so forth. With the, with obviously the computer generated, you create the file and the computer can route them, um, you know, mechanically. So he's in essence like using both sides of the machinations. One, as his own, he's a one-man art factory right. uh, himself. And then sometimes he's doing these other pieces where he's actually using more tools that would be more more contemporary, if you will, automation. <laughs> he's gone into automation. <laughs> right. And using to the, the router. So it, it's a really interesting thing because it kind of complements what he's doing by his own hand. So does that work sell for the same price as the painted pieces? No, it doesn't, and he doesn't, and like I said, he's not selling those, so he doesn't let them go. Right now, I've seen stacks and stacks and stacks of these pieces in his studio. Um, I don't know, I assume that at some point he'll have a show of those. Um, but yeah, the, those pieces are not for sale. That's really interesting. So like he sold, I think he sold a, a few at the Shepherd Ferry show. But that was like the introduction of those pieces. He had never shown those pieces before. And um, I think that since then, he just has decided that he wants to hold back on showing and or selling those. And, and you know, here's a guy who, I, I don't know exactly exactly why, um, but he's also, uh, by the way, though this may seem strange, he's also very into NFTs. <laughs> oh, I've read this recently. I've never had a conversation about it, but... He's really into NFTs. I, I haven't figured out exactly why, but there's something about it, the computer-generated aspect that really uh, he feeds off of. Has he minted anything yet, or is he is he just collecting and thinking and plotting how he's going to uh, enter that market? I think he's plotting. I think he's fascinated. I just think he's fascinated by it. He's, you know, he's, he's an inquisitive guy, and... Uh, I, I just think there's something about it that um, makes him uh, kind of giddy. And right. I'm not sure what it is yet. A couple of times you've referenced uh, your work. What uh, what does your art look like? Well, um, I'm a photographer, and um, you know, in this in this for this book, my my work looks like you know documenting Steve's process. Um, so um, you know, I feel fortunate that he allowed me into the studio so often to to bother him and <laughs> I take his take take some photos of him in action and get like you know some I I think some really, you know, deep moments from him, like contemplating his next step. I think it's really interesting. To me it's you know, he's a I mean the reason why I made the book, he's fascinating to me, if that's not um, already clear. But when you're making so many pieces at one time you know, it's like 40 chess, um, going from one piece to the next, trying to figure out what the highlight is on one piece versus another. Um, that might be wholly different series that he's working on at one time. So he's working on 15 different series at a time. In essence. It's just incredible. So to me, what I try to capture in this particular, um, uh, you know, this book is capture, you know, as much of a sort of contemplation of what's his next step, you know, what's his next stroke going to be, um, what, what's the next color, um, and there's a couple of photos in there that I think really represent that well. My work is, you know, it's both documentary in this sense. I love capturing the works of artists um, in process. It just, it, to me, I've always been interested in, in trying to trying to capture the the thought visually, if you will, that moment, the moments where the in-between moments where like um, the artist is thinking about what is the next step? That to me is really, whatever that reason is, that particular moment is really fascinating to me. And to capture it properly is difficult. <laughs> so that's one of the things that my work is based on. But my, I've done a, a book called, I did a book called Curiosities, uh, which was my um, primary focus is street photography mm -hmm. and and in the book is uh, 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 I consider a noir street photography so it's fully black and white it was released in 2019 um, it's um, it, 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 it's based on trying to as paraphrasing for some other much more famous artists uh, photographers I'm trying to feel a moment uh, uh, you know with the lens and to me, it was 
was about capturing energy from my subjects. Um, when, and most of them didn't know that they were my subjects. It's street photography, it's candid, it's verite. So it's about sort of walking into a moment or noticing something and trying to, to capture it. And in, in this particular case, the, the, the emphasis of the, 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 the work of, of curiosity was to feel some energy. I was feeling very low in the low point in my life. And I was trying to find some inspiration. And the inspiration I found wasn't from me, it was from other people. And from the other, from these scenes that I found, that I was involved with, that I was able to capture, however we can put it, um, I was able to kind of dig myself out of the big hole. And so this book was a, a big deal to me in that regard. It, it, it got me out of that hole and it got me inspired to pursue photography even more um, aggressively. Um, so I do a lot of uh, street photography, some of it's noir. I do a lot of uh, documentary work, uh, a lot of art process documenting, and I do a fair amount of activism work as well, where I'm capturing the scenes of, uh, of uh, different social movements uh, in New York and, and other places. So the book, is it available now, or is it is the, the published date on the, the near horizon? The Steve Keen art book is available uh, for pre-order right now. Um, it's coming officially out in June, but you'll, if you order from the Hat and Beard Press website, um, in essence, you'll get the book you know, first, first come. Uh, it should be shipping in uh, late April. So the, it is available through the Hat and Beard site right now. Okay. Do you have a website where if, if people were interested in your, your uh, noir photography and other uh, projects? Yeah, um, you can look at my work at danielephraim.com, uh, D-A-N-I-E-L-E-F-R-A-M.com. And, uh, there's a link to the Steve Keen book there as well, so I'm sure you'll see it. And, you know, for, the, for those folks that are listening... Uh, amazingly, you know, we we have sat here and, and talked for forty five minutes about uh, an artist whose website you can go to and order what six paintings for seventy dollars, right? So if you if you go to stevekeen dot com, we, we can we can go buy our, our own artwork. How often do you buy Steve Keen artwork? Well, let me let me say that um, Steve is six months behind on orders. So if you're expecting a quick turnaround on your orders you're going to be disappointed. But I guarantee you, if you do wait, you will be very, very happy with what you receive. We can order now for Christmas. Yeah, that's true. Six pieces for $70, including shipping. You don't know what you're getting. You don't get to choose anything. He chooses. This is a big part of the process, is that you don't get to choose. He determines what the package is. But that part of the that's part of this whole thing is buying into the idea that you, you're buying them sight unseen. It's fascinating. This whole thing is fascinating. To me. And you're right. You could, in essence, you could have them for, for, for the holidays, for shop, for your gifts for your friends, which is one of the reasons why there's so much out there. I, I would get packages, um, you know, occasionally. I've worked with them so often that I end up having a lot of these pieces. I mean, I have a lot of these pieces, you know, hundreds of these pieces at this point. Um, and, you know, but I, you don't feel bad about giving them to a friend either. If you have so many, give them as a present. It's never inappropriate. <laughs> right. Um, it's always unique. Um, you know, Ryan, I think in, in, the, in, the, in the book, I think he describes that he's given away all the pieces he's ever had of these or this, in this type of way. He'll go to a, like, you know, friend's cocktail party or something and bring a gift to Steve Keen and then, you know, when I brought, when I went and photographed him with Steve at Steve's studio, I know that he bought, you know, a bunch of pieces from Steve. And, um, you know, I know he'll pass them around to his friends. Um, and then they'll run out and you'll have to get more. And so this is like, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing spreading this cheer. And I don't know how, how, how often I've gotten packages. I mean, I've gotten so many packages from him over the years that it's hard to, put that in perspective as I'm literally sitting amongst hundreds of pieces right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's hard to put it in perspective for you, but I hope that helps. 
Well, Dan, I I really appreciate your time today. I think it's awesome that uh, you kind of identified someone who uh, has a unique voice and vision and have gone out there and documented this and pulled the pieces together. Um, you know, I was able to see uh, a digital copy of of the book and it's beautiful. I mean, you know, your photography, uh, Steve's work, um, the the thoughtful commentary from from Shepard, and like we discussed the the interview with uh, with Ryan. I hope that a lot of people uh, find this and that it, uh, it kind of bl- blooms and blossoms for you uh, because it's a great looking piece of work. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, again, it's all is due to Steve inspiring me, and uh, you know, he, he, I'd like to be an advocate for for artists. And um, that's what I've done most of, most of my career. And uh, I can't think of a more worthy um, project than this one. He deserves it. So um, any accolades that come for this is, is due to him. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Really yeah. cool. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to Art Sense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.